The title of tonight's message is A Song for the Ages. A Song for the Ages. Now, if you weren't here, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of context of what's going on in the story, there is a woman named Hannah, and Hannah was barren. She couldn't have children, and we read this amazing story where she gets ridiculed, and she feels pressure by society. She feels like she's in this desperate situation, and God actually comes through and gives her what she prayed for, but, but the twist of the story was in trying to get the blessings of God and chase after that, Hannah realized that she didn't really need the blessings of God. She just needed God himself. And it's a beautiful story. In First Samuel chapter 2, we actually read about a continuation of the story. It's, it's a praise and a song of worship that Hannah gives to God. And we're going to be reading from uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Through 10. So this, this huge life monumental thing happens. She gets what she's been asking for. Life is good. Don't you love it when life is just good? You ever been in that sweet season where you're like, man, these are just going good. And she has this response to God uh, of praise and worship. And so we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, and Hannah prayed and said, my heart exults in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. So she's saying, my heart is excited. Uh, in the Old Testament, when it says, you know, my horn is exalted in the Lord, that just means you are my strength. God is my strength. And my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Verse 2 says this, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. So now we're going to a section where Hannah, because of her situation, she couldn't have something, and then God gave it to her through an impossible situation. So now she's praising God because God is a God of reversals. Amen? Aren't you glad that, like, when life seems hopeless, when things seem that they can't happen, we serve a God of reversals, meaning that's what's impossible with man is possible with God. And so we read in verse 4, she starts saying that. She says, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on their strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. So she's just basically saying God can do anything. And then in verse 9, she says, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his Anointed. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that uh, we can't do anything without you. And so we just invite you to speak to us tonight. Wherever we're at, would you deposit something specific in every single person in this room? We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we all said. Amen. So like we were saying, this is a direct response that Hannah has to the situation that she's facing. And I don't know about you, but responses in my life are very important. How you respond in life dictates a lot. And I would go so far as to say that most of your life's quality, and not even just your life, but your faith, most of it isn't predicated on what happens to you, but how you respond. Amen? Response is so important. And it can, it can go good, and it can go bad. I remember, uh, you guys remember in 2022, the Academy Awards, you remember when, uh, like, Chris Rock made a joke about Jada Smith and Will Smith? How does he respond? He gets up, he goes on stage, and he slaps that guy in the face in front of 17 million people. Did, did anybody actually see that live? I remember seeing that live, and I was like... Was that real? You know, you see something on TV and you're like, that has to be fake. But it was real. And what's crazy is after that, you know, movies dropped him, brands dropped him, and he, he was in a state of like, man, is this guy's career going to make it? And he responded in a way, and what happened is because he maybe didn't have the correct response, what he had was taken away. 
And then I remember another time, um, a response that I remember, it was 2016, and me and Adrian had just gotten our first house. And it was this weird feeling, because if, whenever you get into, like, your own space, it's kind of weird, because I, 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 I remember, and I love being in my, my parents' house, but, like, when you get in your own space, it's like, wow, I kind of have freedom to, you know, do whatever I want. And I remember we were, uh, had the house for a couple days, and I was just feeling on top of the world, like, I can actually make decisions. When you get to be an adult, sometimes you're like, wow, I can actually make decisions for my own life. This is kind of this is kind of crazy. And I hear the doorbell ring and it's pest control. Now normally pest control is like whatever, you know. But I was so excited because I'm like, "Wow, wait, this guy is trying to sell me pest control and I can say yes or no. Like I'm so stoked about it." So I and honestly, going to the door, I said, "You know what? I'm going to make this guy's day." He's probably been grinding for hours trying to get a sale, but I'm so excited that I have this new house. I can make this decision. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give him a yes. You know, I was, I was ready, and so I opened the door, and I remember I was standing there so proud, and I said, how can I help you? And uh, his response to me is he looks at me, and then you ever know, you ever notice when someone's looking at you, but they're kind of looking past you, right? So he goes, he goes, uh, yeah, I was just, I was wondering if your parents were home. And, uh, and I was crushed in that moment. It was. And that was not the correct response, okay? And I said, you know what? Uh, actually, I'm the owner of this house. And you could tell he was so embarrassed. But at the time, listen, this was, uh, I don't know how many years ago, a lot of years ago. So I wasn't as mature as I want. So I said, ha, I was going to sell you. Now I'm not. Slammed the door in his face. I didn't really do that. But I wanted to do that. He didn't get the sale because he had the wrong response. He could have had something. And it was actually there for him to have but the wrong response made it so he didn't get it. And responses in life, responses in our faith, my hope is that as a ministry, as a people, as a young adult in our community in faith, we would learn how to respond to God in a way where we can keep what he has promised to us and we can actually take a hold of what he has for us. But here's the thing, sometimes in faith, we can't actually grab a hold of the things that God actually wants to give us, because how many of you know that God is a generous God who wants to give us things? In fact, Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says that his gifts and his call are without repentance, so that means that God is so good that sometimes he just gives us things without us deserving it, but there are things that he reserves and waits for us to have the proper response. Everybody would say response. So... How do we respond correctly to God? And that's what we're going to take a look at in this song of Hannah, how she responded to God. Because there's a lot of times that you can have moments and encounters with the Lord, but what do you actually do with those moments? What do you actually do with those encounters? How do we properly respond? And, And the simplest answer that I can give you guys is it's actually just called worship. You know, we worship on stage, but worship goes beyond singing songs. Worship goes beyond playing instruments. Worship is a type of lifestyle, and and the simplest way I can define it for you, it's the glad response to the goodness of God. How many of you know God is so good in our lives? He, He wants to give us so many things. He's amazing, and worship in our life is how we choose to respond to God's goodness. That means that worship can happen in our workplace, Worship can happen in our family dinners. Worship can happen at our colleges. Worship can happen in the marketplace. Worship can happen in all areas of our lives. And I think sometimes it's a tragedy when we think that worship is just 30 minutes once a week on a stage. But let me tell you, your life will look dramatically different if you learn how to worship God in every area and truly respond to who he is and what's he, what he wants to do in our lives. In everything, I want to glorify the Lord. In everything, I want to say, I put him first. I put him before everything else in my life. And with Hannah, this is, was not just an experience with God. It was a moment that shifted her perspective on who God was in her life. And this is something that we have to capture as, as young adults is God has moments with us But that's not supposed to be different and separate from the rest of our lives. In fact, he doesn't want you to just have a moment. But in times like this, he wants you to have moments of realization that shift your perspective how you see God and changes the way that you live every single day. So Hannah, she had this miracle happen to her. And it wasn't just like she had the miracle and then she went on with her life. No, no, she had the miracle and then she publicly made this declaration to everybody that said, guys, this is who God is. 
God is incomparable. He's without fault. He, he's a God of reversals. And I know that like we can tweet whatever we want nowadays, right? You can say whatever you want publicly. But back, back then in ancient Israel, when you publicly said something, that's who you were. Like you couldn't just go back on saying something publicly. And so Hannah went publicly and she said, she declared to everybody, this is who God is. And that might seem a, a, far, a far off way from you to say, yeah, I, I know, I really want to, to live for the Lord. I really want to serve him. But in everything that kind of, it just seems like such a long distance. And you really don't have to worry about the distance. You just have to worry about the next step. And, and we actually see this truth in the very beginning of what Hannah is talking about. And what she says in the very beginning is in the first three verses, if you, you'll miss it if you don't really look at it. But I love that there's a progression to the way that she worships God. There's a progression to what, what she believes and then what she declares. Because in verse 1, it says, my heart, my horn, my mouth. And Hannah praying said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. And you know what's crazy is here comes verse 2. And it changes in verse 2. It says, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. So she's no longer talking to herself. She's now talking to other people. There is no rock like our God. And so what happens in this moment is there's a progression of Hannah's response, and the more that she properly responds to God, she goes from encouraging herself to actually prophesying and encouraging the people around her. And I know it can seem so daunting to think about, well, how am I supposed to take faith where I go? You know, Thursdays is such a safe environment, it's so amazing, everybody worships the Lord. How do I go and I take that out? But it's a progression of if you properly learn how to respond to God, it'll be a natural progression of your life. It'll be a natural strengthening of your faith. The more you respond to God properly, aka the more that you worship, the more your faith will be strengthened. And you will learn how to worship God in every area of your life. And the goal is not that, you know, you're known in your life for your accomplishments or deeds or any of that, but I want to be known that I was a man that loved the Lord. Like at the end of my life, you ever guys ever think about death, you know, it's, it's a kind of morbid thought, but sometimes I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking to Adrian, sometimes I'll be like, you ever think about like when you died, who would come to your funeral? Everybody, anybody, am I crazy? Or sometimes I'm like, I wonder who wouldn't come, you know, like, or who I'd be surprised to come. But at the end of my life, no matter what, I just want to be known that, hey, Spencer was a dude that loved the Lord. Like, man, like, maybe he wasn't the best at everything, but at the end of my days, what am I going to be known for? What are you going to be known for? And we have to commit to a life that says, God, in everything, my response is worship. And that's why I love our church. I mean, that's why I love, you know, the production. And I get a lot, you know, sometimes I get comments like, well, you go to that church that does all the lights and, and God doesn't, God, you never hear that. God doesn't need all that. God doesn't need the lights. God doesn't need the haze. God doesn't need the good instruments. You know, we hear that all the time. And that's true, you know, honestly. God doesn't need that. Worship doesn't need that. But at the end of the day, I think I want to respond in my worship as best as I possibly can in a way that honors God. And I, I had a conversation with somebody. Um, on, I didn't know him online. And usually I don't reply to people. But this time, you know, it's just like, sometimes your humanity, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk with this guy. And he's like, I just don't understand. I don't understand it. Why, why, why do it? Why do the lights? Why do the music? And, and I told him, I was like, well, you know what? Let's say Jesus shows up to you at your work and tells you, hey, man, I'm going to be at your house at 5 o'clock. Can you make dinner for me? Right? I told them, are you going to go home and are you going to throw some, some pizza rolls in the oven at 425 for 12 minutes and be good with that? And then when Jesus comes over, be like, yeah, you know, I'm just communing with Jesus. He doesn't need it. He doesn't. I thought pizza rolls were good enough for him. I'm like, no, you probably would be like, I, I got to go get steak. I got to get potatoes. I got to do a meal for Jesus because it's not about what he needs. It's about what it does for us when we make the decision to give God our best. And when you give your, your God, when you give God your best, just watch how he begins to shift your perspective so that your life looks dramatically different. My hope for you is that a year from now, two years from now, this wouldn't just be a, a Thursday where you get a good message and you get good worship and then you go and you, no, no, my hope is that in two years, you wouldn't even recognize yourself right now. Because you are slowly and surely going through a life of proper response to God after moments and after encounters to where your life looks so dramatically 
different. It's called maturity. It's called sanctification. It's called the process of just responding to God in a healthy way. And it will strengthen your faith. You know, a lot of strength comes from stewardship. Uh, that's where we, we, a lot of our, our faith will be strengthened is in stewardship. Is no one, no one here? Where you know, I know he probably hates raising his hand, but Noah is like, he can bench like a thousand pounds. There he is, look at him, in the front row. Um, you know, I started working out, but I'm nothing like Noah. Noah's like, you know, he's crazy. Again, literally, he can bench a thousand pounds. Um, but, you know, when you have physical goals, when you're going to the gym, right? It's like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna lift weights, I'm gonna do a workout regimen. But the thing that people always tell you and the thing that nobody wants to do is the diet, right? It's like, yeah, I'll go, I'll lift a bunch of weights. Yeah, I'll go do my thing. And he's like, and then I'll hit McDonald's on the way back home, right? And what you'll find is, yes, lifting weights is part of the equation. Of course, it's so important. You got to get your cardio and you got to get your weightlifting. You got to get all that in. But if you don't actually work on your diet, if you don't actually work on what you're going to eat, the nourishment in your body, you'll learn that sometimes you, you're not quite meeting your goals and you feel like the work that you're putting in isn't actually showing through what you look like. And then what happens is you get frustrated and then you quit. Well, I was going to the gym for six months, didn't see any improvement, and so it's a waste of time. When in reality, it's not a waste of time, you just weren't doing the proper work. And in our lives, it, it, the Thursday nights can be our gym, right? It can be, you need it. You need local community. You need church. You need edification. You need encouragement. You need worship. You need people around you, small groups, all of that. Yes, you do. But if you don't take time to actually, throughout the week, learn how to respond in the small areas of your life, in the conversations that you have, in in the way that people talk to you, in the way that you talk back, in, in the things that, in your mindset, in all the small areas of your life, what you will find is that you are not becoming the person that you think you should be becoming. And it gets frustrating. And I've had so many people, I've, I've talked to so many people that are like, yeah, no, I tried, I tried the whole church thing. It just does, it wasn't for me. And my fear is that we'll come to a place like this and think that this is the ultimate change that we need, and then throughout our week, we get frustrated, and we're like, man, God, why, am I, why does my life look the same? I'm trying to live for you, but I feel like it's not working, and I love James 1.22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I desperately, desperately want this ministry to be a place where you're like, man, I don't recognize who I was six months ago. Man, I struggled so much with anxiety. I struggled so much with friendships, with relationships, with finances. I struggled so much in these areas of my life. And it's crazy because I look back on who I was. I don't even recognize myself. You know, I, uh, Zach Miller is also in here, and I had a conversation with him. He, he leads our adopted block, and he's incredible. And I was just talking to him yesterday, and he was just talking about, he's like, yeah, you know, I came to Thursdays, and I loved it, and then I would leave early. And he goes, and one day... You know, I adopted a, a missions trip came up, and I really felt challenged by the, the word that Phil gave. And so he's like, I just decided, like, I'll take a step of faith, and I'll do the missions trip. And he, he got encouraged on that trip. And then he's like, okay. And then he came back, and he, he started meeting people. And he said, it was really overwhelming at first. Like, at first, I was like, man, this is really tough for me. And now he's leading adopt a block Now he's actually encouraging people where he's at. And he got, literally said to my face, he goes, it's crazy. I don't even recognize the person that I was a year ago, but that's the heart that God has for you, is that you wouldn't stay how you are, but you would grow in your faith and your maturity to a place where God wants to lead you. Aren't aren't you guys thankful that we serve a God that sees us where we're at, but pulls us to where he has called us to be? The more that you respond to God, the more you will recognize the fundamental truth that God is incomparable. He's incomparable. You know, we'll go back to um, the verse, verses four, and it talks about the reversals that he has. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. It's crazy because the more that we experience God, the more that we realize, man, nothing in this life could ever compare to who he is He fulfills me. He gives me purpose. I am completely and utterly loved by God exactly how I am. And the more that you experience God, the more that you realize that. Um, A couple uh, years ago, actually, I don't know, this is probably, me and Adrian have had a progression. We've been married um, 
from 2016, and uh, when I met Adrian, she was a very picky eater. Any picky eaters in there? Awesome. A few of you, a few of you guys. You know, so I, I bet there's more. You just don't want to uh, admit it. Um, and, and I'll actually have uh, the band start coming out. I'm going to close here in a little bit. But when I met Adrian, she was a really picky eater. And I always thought it was, like, interesting because I grew up, and my mom always said, like, gave me adventure bites. That was my mom. She was like, I was like, ew, that's disgusting. And she's like, it's an adventure bite. I'm like, oh, sick. All right, cool. Let me. And I, and I just learned to like a lot of different foods. So there's a lot of foods that, you know, I pretty much eat whatever. And uh, Adrian's not the same person as me. She doesn't eat a lot of things um, more so now. But the, it's funny because when we started dating, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, let's go. I, I love avocado toast. And she's like, oh, I hate avocados. I'm like, really? Seems like such an odd food to have such a strong opinion against, right? Okay, whatever. You, you don't like avocados. And then it would go on. And we'd try another food. And I'd be like, hey, you want to go to this place? And she'd go, ugh, I hate that food. I'm like, really? Man. And over, the, over time... It was like, man, you don't like a lot of food. Like, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of pickiness in your eating and whatever. You know, I'm just trying to be respectful. You know, you're in the beginning stages of dating. I'm not going to make an issue out of it because it's a small issue. But eventually, right, I mean, we're probably in year like five or six, and I'm like, what is your deal? Like, what? <laughs> what? You know, and, and I remember this one time. I'm like, oh, it's amazing, crab, whatever. And she's like, ugh, I don't like crab. And I, I'm like, okay, you got to tell me. Please tell me. What don't you like about crap? Like, what is it about? And she's like, I just know. I just know that I don't like it. I'm like, yes, I know that you don't like it, but is it like it's too fishy? Is it the taste? Is it the texture? Just tell me because I think it's amazing and I want to know. And she goes, I, I, just, yeah, I, I just don't like it. I'm like, you can't give me a good reason. She goes, I never had it. <laughs> and I was like, what do, you, what, do you, what do you mean you never had it? She's like, I've never had it. Like, why, why would you say you didn't like it? She goes, I know. I just know that I wouldn't like it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like, has this been our entire relationship? All these foods that you've never tried? Have you ever had any of them? And she's like, no. I just know I wouldn't like it. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? No. No, 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 no. I am going to lead you to a path of righteousness. You are going to try these foods. You're going to take the adventure bites. And so... We, we, and then, she, so she started trying food, and of course, you know, she didn't like some of it, but some of it like crab. She tried it, and she was like, oh, this is so good. And I said, I know, I know. It was, a, it was a glorious moment in our relationship. And then she started trying these foods, and all of a sudden, she's like, man, and then her family's like, what did you do? She's a different woman. She actually eats all these foods, and I'm like, I know. She actually just tried them, and, and we, now it's like we go to a place, and she's like, do they have crab? You know, we go, we go to a breakfast place. Do they have avocado toast? And it's so funny because she just didn't give it a shot. She just felt like she knew what she wanted. But actually, when she actually tried it, it was like, oh, I actually, I actually really enjoy this. And, you know, it's so funny because I think sometimes in our faith, we just, we're kind of self-fulfilling prophecies of ourselves. And we say statements like, uh, I'll never be that way. Oh, man, I just, I just screw up with relationships. I'll never have a healthy relationship. Oh, man. My, my family, my parents were bad with finances. I just, uh, I'm in debt. I, it's, it's just, you know, that's just who I am. And what happens is, is if, without even realizing it, we come to a place where we are actually speaking things over ourselves. And, and we come to a place that I would challenge you and say, you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, you have this view of God in your life and what he can and can't do just because you haven't really given him a shot to prove himself. You haven't given him the chance to show that he is a faithful God, that he is a loving God, that he actually does come through for you, that he actually does show up, that he actually is who he says he is in Scripture. The more you experience God, the more that you give him a shot, the more you will, he will prove his faithfulness to you. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I love that because, you know, if you think about a lamp, right, ancient lamp, oil lamp, it has a radius of like six feet, which means you can't really see where you're going until you commit to actually move forward. And, and the light that you possess around you is good for the next step. And you, if you look up and you look out, all you'll see is darkness. But when you commit to actually take the next step, it actually becomes illuminated and your path actually becomes clear. And the same thing is with the Lord. The more that you give him a chance, 
the more that you actually believe and pray that God would do what he said he could do, that, that you would believe in my family, in my life, in my job, in every area, the more that you actually go to him and say, Lord, would you help me in this area, the more that he will prove that he will, that he's willing, that he can do what nobody else can do. It reminds me of a, a story in, in the Gospels when in Matthew 14, Peter He's a disciple, and I love this story because uh, Peter, he walks on water with Jesus. And if you've heard the story, it's incredible. You know, it, there, it, there's a storm, they can't really see, and Jesus is out on the water, and uh, he announces himself, and Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus calls him out, and it's, it, he gets out of the boat, and there's disciples with him, but he gets out, and he begins stepping on the water, and he actually literally walks on the water towards Jesus. And he slips and he falls because he looks at the storm. But, you know, the point of the story is, is I just can't, I mean, this is like really happened, you know. Sometimes we read it like it's a fairy tale or a, oh, yeah. But this actually happened. I mean, imagine being on a boat, right? And it's like, it's shaky and, and you see Jesus. And, and here's what's really powerful about the story. This is actually a moment that was critical. It was, it was a moment with God that shaped him for the rest of his life. Because up until this point, he had watched Jesus do miracles. He'd watched him do healings. He'd watched him do this. And, and the miracle before this, he went to God and he said, hey God, there's a lot of people here. I don't, we don't have enough food. And God actually did the miracle and said, feed these, these people in front of you. And so literally directly before this, this miracle, Peter was in a spot and he said, God, uh, this can't be done. Like this, this is impossible. And then Jesus came through. And even before that, there was a ton of times where he observed miracles. But this time, he was on the boat. And it's almost as if, like, he had this moment and this realization. And, and Jesus was out there, and he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to walk to you. And there was a moment that he said, you know what? I'm going to participate in this thing. You know, I, I, this isn't just something that I want to watch this isn't just something that I want to observe. I just want to be a part of it. And, G and Jesus calls him out, and he begins to walk on water. And I can just imagine, like, you know, the first time he's probably like, and realizing that it's sure-footed, and then he steps out, and he's like, wow, this is crazy. This is, this is I'm, actually, I'm actually standing and walking on water. And then the next step is probably a little bit more exciting and what happens is slowly, I can just imagine, his hesitancy actually becomes a little bit of an anticipation and an excitement and expectation for the next step. Every step for sure was easier than the last. And what I love about our faith with the Lord is that the steps may be scary at first in responding to God in the proper way like Hannah did. Hannah said, no, no, this isn't just a moment that I have with God. This isn't just something that he does, but this is somebody who he is in my life. And the more that we respond to that goodness, the more that we respond in a way that honors God, the easier that it will become for us to walk forward. You ever see people that are so confident in your faith and you're like, man, if I could just, if I could just have that. All it takes is just, it's responding to God in a correct way. Hebrews 11, one says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of things not seen. And I love this, this song of, of Hannah. And, you know, it's, what's really cool about this song is at the end, right, we talked about how she was encouraging herself and then she goes to encourage other people. Well, at the end uh, of the verse 8, or not 8, but if we go farther down in verse 10, it says, The adversities of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Now, this is amazing. She concludes her song by saying, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And this is actually the first time in scripture, you know, a couple weeks ago we talked about how Han uh, Mary, when she was carrying Jesus, drew inspiration from Hannah. This is the first time in scripture that uh, the Bible points us to the Messiah through a king. Because when she's saying this, she's talking about a king. She's talking about the anointed one. Well, there was no king in Israel at the time. It was a time of judges, so there wasn't any kings. And this is the, one of the first times that this exact word, his anointed, is used, which translates to Messiah. And so what happened is through Hannah's response, she 
came, she went from a place of, okay, God, this is who you are in my life. I'm experiencing it. And by the end of it, she's actually pointing towards a future that she can't see, but encouraging other people that, hey, there is a king coming. There is the Messiah coming. She could be confident in what she didn't even see. You know what's the, the biggest deterrent sometimes in our lives is the future, right? Anxiety and worry about what tomorrow is gonna bring. I don't know how I'm gonna make it to, to the end of the week, all of this, but when you respond to God in the correct way, let me tell you that you will have confidence to look to the future, even if you can't see it, and say, man, God is faithful. He'll make a way. I don't need anything else. God is incomparable. He is so good. He is so faithful. No matter where I find myself at in life, like Adrian was saying, no matter where, what I respond to, how I respond, God is still the faithful one in your life. I'll invite everybody to stand on your feet.